Welcome to First Words, a podcast presented by the First United Methodist Church of Florence. Today's message is brought to you by Senior Pastor Rev. Dale Cohen. The gospel lesson that Calvin read for us just a moment ago reminds me of a story that Winston Churchill used to love to tell. A little boy fell off of a pier into some deep water, and there was a sailor, old sailor, close by with no regard for his own life, dove in, went under, had to struggle to bring the boy back up to the surface and then get the boy back up safely on the pier. Well, a little bit later that day, the boy's mother came looking for whoever it was who saved her son. And when she found the sailor, and she asked, are you the one who saved my boy? And he said, yes, ma'am, I am. And she said, well, where's his hat? (laughs) In our scripture, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem when he encounters a small community of lepers somewhere near the border of Galilee and Samaria. Now, the more modern translations say skin disease, but the older translations refer to them as lepers. Uh, This was not uh, the Hansen's disease type of leprosy, the bacterial infection that we know of as leprosy today. It could have been any irritating skin condition that reddened, infected, or caused inflammation. If we use the biblical understanding of this skin disease today, the protocol for leprosy would apply to anybody with rosacea, eczema, impetigo, shingles, or even athlete's foot. What these ten men have in common is that they're stuck in a challenging situation. They live on the margins. They're outcasts. They're considered socially, religiously, and physically unclean. They can't work. They can't interact with others. They don't live the same kind of life that everybody else lives. They're entirely dependent on the mercy and the goodwill of others. So when they see Jesus coming, they think there's an opportunity for things to change. The Scripture says, keeping their distance, they called out saying, Jesus Master, have mercy on us. The lepers show respect by keeping their distance as required by the Mosaic law. The book of Leviticus says this, The person with the defiling disease shall wear torn clothes and let their hair be disheveled, and he shall cover his upper lip and cry out, Unclean, unclean. He shall remain unclean for as long as he has the disease. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. Now, we don't know if these ten men thought that Jesus could heal them or whether they were just simply going to ask him for money so that they could buy food. However, Jesus, when he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they went... They were made clean. The reason that Jesus sent them to the priests was because they would confirm the men's healing. They would, uh, once they received confirmation, the men would then have to offer a purification sacrifice. And then when the sacrifice was complete, the priest would give them a certificate of cleanliness that they could then take back to their community, which would allow them to go back home with their family, to interact with others, and to go back to work. On their way, though, to find a priest, they discover that they've been healed. Verse 15 says, Then one of the ten, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet. He laid face down at the feet of Jesus and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Well, Jesus healed all ten, but only one returned to give thanks. Luke reveals, and I'll leave this up to you to determine why this is an important fact, but Luke says this guy was a Samaritan someone despised and hated 
for his mixed race. He is the only one who returns offering gratitude to Jesus. And so then Jesus asks him, we're not ten made clean, so where are the other nine? Did none of them return to give glory to God except this foreigner? Then Jesus said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has made you well. Now, let's be fair. It's quite possible that the other nine had intended that once they got their certificate, that they would come back and find Jesus and offer their gratitude. I mean, it could take actually a couple of days because first they would have to find a priest, and then the priest would have to inspect them according to the Levitical law. Then they would have to confirm that they were clean. Then they would have to go and make their sacrifice. And then they would get their certificate. So maybe they were going to come back. But it's this one guy who immediately returns to Jesus to offer his thanks and his praise. Gratitude is more than being thankful. According to clinical researchers, there are two stages of gratitude. The first stage is where one acknowledges receiving a gift. And not only does the gift bring them joy, but the thought that somebody went to the effort to choose a gift brings them joy. That's the first stage of gratitude. The second stage of gratitude that a lot of us never get to is fully recognizing that the source of the gift lies outside ourselves. In other words, we have nothing to do with why that gift was given to us. That it is solely out of the goodness and the graciousness and the sacrifice of another. It's not because of us, but it is for us. That's the second stage of gratitude. In Deuteronomy, God challenged the Israelites to remember His gifts when they prospered in the Holy Land that He had promised them. He said in Deuteronomy 8, Do not say to yourself, My power and the might of my own hand have gotten me this wealth. But remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth, so that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your ancestors as he is doing today. When things are going well and we're experiencing success, it's very tempting to congratulate ourselves, assuming that it's our effort and our wisdom and our talent and our ability that has led to the success. While it's true that there are blessings for the wise management of the resources that we have. The fact of the matter is that none of us has gotten to where we are without God's help, but also without the help of others. Leah Waldron talks about an incident that drove this point home for her. Each night before dinner, as her family gathers at their table, they offer a blessing. Well, one evening, they ask their daughter, Davy what she was thankful for. And being somewhat of a pragmatist, she just began to pray for the things that were right there in front of her on her plate. So her prayer was, thank you God for broccoli and fish and water and wine. And Leah says it was her wine, not her daughter's wine. And thank you for this plate and this fork. Amen. Well, Leah rolled her eyes at this rather obvious laundry list until she thought about, well, what would it be like if I were as grateful for the things that are right in front of me? She wrote these words. Suddenly, I was overwhelmed by sheer thankfulness for having enough food to eat, for a husband who lovingly prepared our meal, for the pleasure of having a variety of delicious flavors on my plate, for the privilege of having available at the grocery store fresh food, for the labor of those who grew and harvested the food, those who processed, packed, shipped, and sold it, 
for modern conveniences that make the food easy to prepare and easy to eat, for clean water to drink, for wine to enjoy. Ah, I may fool myself into thinking that the fact that I earned the money to purchase this meal means it's not a gift. But I only have to scratch the surface of gratitude to reveal just how flimsy that illusion is. When we think about our lives, and we think about all that other people have done for us. For instance, when's the last time you went out and harvested rubber to make tires to put on your car so that you could drive around town? Probably never. (laughs) There are countless people who have contributed to our lives and and the increased awareness of what others have done for us creates more gratitude in our hearts. So, to be genuinely grateful requires the spiritual discipline of awareness and remembering. Practicing this discipline keeps us tethered to God and aware of God's presence. Again, as Moses was preparing the Israelites to step into the promised land, in Deuteronomy 4 we read these words, But take care and watch yourselves closely, so as neither to forget the things that your eyes have seen, nor to let them slip from your mind all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. What God is trying to get the Israelites to do is to teach gratitude to their children, to continually sing praise to God for all that we've been given, to practice a life of gratitude. Now, we all know that we need to remember God's grace in our lives, but life gets in the way. We're busy, distracted, and sometimes, yes, we just even forget. Forgetfulness leads to complaining, and complaining leads to feeling entitled, Feeling entitled leads to self-centeredness, and self-centeredness leads to stinginess. We'll never be givers if we fail at gratitude. So, let's talk for just a few moments about how to cultivate grateful remembrance. I want to offer six key points this morning. And the first, it's just intentionally choose gratefulness. Research shows benefits to the intentional practice of gratitude, like increased happiness, improved health, better sleep, even more mobility, less depression, and a greater desire to help others. Gratitude can improve our marriages, strengthen our relationships with our children, and even make us better friends. Also, It helps us to grow in our relationship with God. The Scripture says this in 1 Thessalonians, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. By choosing gratefulness, not only do we accomplish God's will, but we live a healthier and happier life. Choose gratefulness. Secondly, though, we need to inventory our blessings. We have so many blessings in our lives. A new day, a warm bed, a loving spouse, or maybe the memory of a loving spouse that other people don't have. We have a great church, a child in our lives, a tasty meal, or a visit with a friend. When we begin to list all the blessings in our lives, then gratitude begins to take root. The psalmist said this, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all His benefits. When we forget, we take for granted. But when we inventory, we have the potential to change our hearts and our lives immensely. The third key is to abandon a deficiency mindset for a sufficiency mindset. Most of us, by default, have a deficiency mindset where we focus on what we don't have 
rather than a sufficiency mindset where we focus on all that we do have. We're a product of our culture that capitalizes on discontent. Consumer culture doesn't want us to be grateful because to be grateful means you're satisfied. Consumer culture needs us to be unhappy so they can sell us a solution. Well, we have everything that we need in Jesus Christ. Paul declared this in Philippians 4, my God will fully satisfy every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Again, you've heard me say this before, God doesn't supply our every want, but God can supply what we need, and that will be enough. That is what we can be grateful for. The fourth key is to embrace humility. Why? Humility is necessary for gratitude because without it, we tend to think that we've accomplished more on our own than is accurate. We downplay God's role. We downplay the contributions of others. True humility comes from remembering that there is a God and we're not it. The scripture in James says this, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers and sisters. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Without humility, when life is going well, we feel entitled. But when life is going bad, we feel slighted. And neither of those are helpful. We need humility to recognize the hand of God and others at work in our lives. The fifth thing is that we need to compare ourselves to those with less, not more. I already mentioned how our consumer culture keeps us unhappy because we don't have. Well, comparing ourselves with those who have more adds to this discontent. However, when we look at those with less, it challenges us to ask the question, am I doing everything I can with what I have? One of the most condemning statistics is that poor people give a greater percentage of their income to others than those of us who are comfortable. Poor people give a greater percentage of their income to others That is surprising, but it's true. Hebrews says this, keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For God has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. If we must compare ourselves with others, then let's compare ourselves with others who inspire us to be more grateful and to be more generous. And that will make a difference in our lives too. The last thing is to look for God in our difficulties. It's easy to be grateful when things are going well. However, it's more challenging to thank God during the difficult days, like when we experience the death of a loved one, or illness, or disease, or rejection, or failure. No one is exempt from trouble. Everybody faces trouble at some point. But God is always at work amid the strife. But we have to have grateful eyes to see where God is at work. Romans says this, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to His purpose. Embracing gratitude during our difficult days helps us focus on where good things are happening, not just on the difficult things, but on where the good things are happening. And that creates even more gratitude for what God is doing in working on our behalf, no matter what the circumstances. Now, I said I was going to give you six key points, but I want to give you a bonus point today. In Living Life on Purpose... Greg Anderson talks about a friend whose wife left him, 
And this friend became very depressed and angry. He lost faith in himself, he lost faith, faith in others, and he lost faith in God. One rainy morning, he went to a small neighborhood diner, and although the place was, was busy, it was really kind of quiet because everybody in there was keeping to themselves. It was like everybody in there was in their own little world. Well, in a small booth, there sat a young mother with her little girl, and the little girl broke the silence as the waitress brought food to her table, and she just kind of blurted out rather loudly, Mama, why don't we say our blessing here? And with that, the waitress turned back around toward the table, and she said, Well, we can say a blessing. Would you say it for us? And the little girl agreed. And the waitress turned back around, faced everybody out in the restaurant, and said, Bow your heads. Well, after a moment, everybody kind of gathered themselves, put their forks and knives down and bowed their heads. And the little girl folded her hands and said, God is great. God is good. Let us thank Him for our food. Well, the whole atmosphere in the diner changed. People began to talk to one another, and there was energy in the room. And the waitress even said, we need to do this every morning. Well, the sad man told his friend Greg, all of a sudden, my whole frame of mind started to improve. From the little girl's example, I decided to thank God for all that I have and stop focusing on what I'd lost. And I started to be grateful. So this is the bonus point here. Hang out with grateful people. If you hang out with people who are grateful, it's infectious, and you're going to be grateful too. Cling to those people who positively impact your life and help you to discover God's grace anew. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thank you for listening to First Words. For more information about our services or how to get involved in our community, visit us at fumcflorence.org or facebook.com slash florencefumc.